Hello and welcome back to the Elise Yeezy Show. I am your host, Elise Yeezy, and today I am joined by neuroscientist Tally Sharot. How are you doing? Good. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming on. So for my audience, Tali is a professor of cognitive neuroscience at MIT and I believe a London university. Am I right? A London based university? Yeah. At UCL, yeah. University College London. Yeah. Yeah, that's the one. And author of books such as The Optimism Bias and The Influential Mind. So today I'd like to talk about a variety of topics, largely the effects of the internet upon the mind, misinformation, how to best set yourself up for success. Um but let's maybe go over first a bit about you and your career. Why did you choose to go down the neuroscience route? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I always thought it was just fascinating, right? Your brain is such a fascinating piece of machinery and it really is everything that is you. Um, any thought, any feeling, um, any belief that you have, it's all, it all starts and kind of ends um, inside your head, in your mind. Um, so I just thought that was a really fascinating kind of thing to study. But also, um, if someone is, as I am, interested in just people around you and about and yourself, like, why do you do what you do? Why do you kind of believe what you believe? And why do other people do what they do? Which is things that I'm sure everyone thinks about all the time. Um, that's um, a way to find answers. So I think it was kind of a natural uh, curiosity driven um, occupation. And then, and then what led into the work on the optimism bias, like for example? Mm -hmm. um, so that was a bit of a coincidence really. Um, so I did my PhD in New York um, in the early 2000s. Um, and the PhD was about emotional memories, so memories of traumatic events, which is something that my um, advisor was studying and out of all the options that were available, that kind of seemed interesting to me. Um, and so I studied that and I studied things like because I was there doing 9-11, how people recalled events from 9-11, how those memories are different from just your regular memories. And when I finished my PhD, I went to do a postdoc at Harvard. Um, and when I got there, um, I learned that people were studying how people not necessarily remember the past, but imagine the future. Right. Um, and they were suggesting suggesting that the way that we are able to imagine the future, what's going to happen to you in a month, what are you going to eat to dinner today, really relies on your memories. Um, so the kind of same mechanisms that I've been studying um, in memory, they were saying, well, we can look at these memory and these mechanisms to try to understand how people think about the future, imagine and plan ahead. And because I was interested in how emotion affects memory, I was like, well, it'll be interesting to see how emotion affects the way that we imagine the future and especially traumatic negative events, because that's what I was studying. Hmm. But when I did my first um, study, when I asked people to imagine these negative events happening to them in the future, what um, happened was, is that people kind of twisted those events to make them better. So for example, I would say, imagine uh, breaking up with your romantic partner, and they'd say something, I broke up with my romantic partner, and then I found a better one. Hmm. Um, or I would say, imagine getting stuck out of your apartment, um, and they didn't say, I imagine getting stuck of my apartment. And then I called the landlady. She comes in with a key and lets me back in. So they were always kind of trying to find solutions, right? I put them in these kind of negative situations in their mind. But when they think about it in the future, automatically, they think about how can I solve it? How can I make it better? Right. And it ends up being not a negative event. It ends up being a perfectly okay event. Um, sometimes people came up with these like extraordinary um, things. I like said, imagine... I wanted also to compare it to just neutral events. Just imagine like something really boring. So I said, imagine getting a haircut, which I guess can be exciting. But um, what uh, someone said, I imagine getting a haircut and donated my hair to Locks of Love, which is a charity for kids with cancer. And then we all went to celebrate like me and friends. So, you know, when like even like a mundane event, like getting a haircut, when you think about it in the future, it turns out that people have this tendency to think about it in a more sparkly way I would say um so at the beginning I was I was really upset about this because I wanted to study how, how people imagine negative traumatic events in the future and wanted to look at the neural mechanisms by looking at their brain using brain imaging and they wouldn't do it they kept changing it to positive so this was a real problem and I tried all sorts of different tasks 
And after quite a bit of time, maybe a couple of months or so, I thought, well, you know what, this is actually maybe more interesting than what I started off with. Why do they do this? And why do we have this tendency um, to think about the future as better than the past and the present? That then led me to this whole literature that already existed in a field called behavioral economics um, that is related to the optimism bias, this tendency to believe that the future will be better than the past and the present. And why do people do that? What drives that optimistic mm -hmm. projection? Yeah, I think it's um, beneficial for us, right? I mean, obviously it's beneficial to think about how can I solve problems, right? Or how I can jump over hurdles to make things better. Um, if we can imagine it, it's easier for us to have a plan, a blueprint of what we should be doing. Hmm. Um, and also it enhances our motivation because if you can imagine how you would get to your goals and how you would solve problems, that enhances your motivation. You feel, okay, I can go out there. I can try, right? If all you can imagine is I'm going to fail, I'm not going to find, you know, a partner, um, I'm not going to be able to get into my house, then you don't really try, right? And if you don't try, then obviously you don't succeed. That's the first requirement is that we put in effort and, and try to achieve those goals. So I think it's kind of a necessity. Um, and so for that reasons, uh, I think humans have evolved to have this optimistic bias tendency because the likelihood of survival is greater if mm. you, you have it in general. Hmm. Speaking of human evolution, I'd like to go on to the internet. Um, but to really, I guess, boil it down, when I look at the internet, I'm seeing this exchange of information. Right now, we're having a conversation. We're exchanging information. So to go right to the beginning, why do humans like to share information in the first place in general? Yeah, I think there's a few reasons. One is there is there is an advantage to the whole species, to the whole society, right? Mm. Um, if all I know is just inside my head and I don't share it. And then, you know, it goes with me to my grave. Then the next person who comes along has to start from ground zero. So it makes absolute sense that in order for a species to develop, we need to continually share information. And so um, one possibility that again, in order, when, when things are helpful in terms of evolution and progression of a species, Many times, the what happens is they turn to be something that is rewarding, that feel good, right? And that anytime that something feels good, you want to do it. Hmm. And if you want to share because it makes you feel good, well, that means that other people can get the information. It's good for our species in general. Um, so it seems that um, sharing information is something that makes people feel good. There has been studies looking at brain activity, um, and it's been shown that when people share information, even when it's just like very mundane information, there is like a trigger of um, a reward signal in the part of the brain that's the reward center and reward system. So we think it is rewarding um, on average to share information. And there's good reason why uh, you would want to do that on average. Now, of course, um, it doesn't matter how useful the information is, you know, how is it going to make other people feel? Um, is it something that they don't know? Is it something that they do know? Um, and that's like a whole other question because that, that you know, basically boils down to a person trying to predict what other people know and what they want to know in order to give them the information that will be helpful for them versus information that actually can get them in the wrong direction. Yes, because, and I can only really go anecdotally, but I find that... With the internet, we have almost an information overload. There's a bit in The Influential Mind where you give some mm -hmm. stats about, you know, there's like 3 billion internet users every day. There's like a million YouTube videos watched or like a thousand uploaded every second, et cetera, et cetera. This overflow of information. And then when I look at certain social media sites, uh, Facebook, Twitter, sometimes TikTok, if I go on to news sites, the Metro, this English newspaper, et cetera, et cetera, it seems to me to be quite negative um though that's only anecdotally though i go on the internet everything seems to be quite negative so i guess i'm wondering 
how can we trust ourselves on the internet to not be swayed by emotive arguments? Because it seems to be, to me, anyway, this is all anecdotal. This isn't like, you know, um, it just seems to me that people are becoming more divided than ever, whether the topic is about vaccines or Trump and Biden or Brexit and not Brexit, et cetera, et cetera. What effect is that having on our minds to see this overload of information every day? Yeah. Um, so I think there's a few problems when it comes to getting information online. And one of the problems is that you're not just getting random selection of information, right? The information that you see is information that has been catered for you mm. um, by algorithms, by the facts that you tend to follow people who are like you, that think like you and so on. Um, and so that creates these kind of bubbles, right? Where we're getting information, but we're not really getting all the information. We're getting kind of information from people who are um, maybe in our uh, geographical area or in the same kind of political group, right? Um, and because we don't have all the information that can really lead to misconceptions, which we see that all the time. So it's a problem. On one hand, there's so much information. On the other hand, we're really only seeing part of the of the, of the information. Um, so that that's a problem. Then another totally different problem is it's created in another way, which is people when they post, just like personal posts, right? I mean, they're not going to post everything. They're going to post what they want others to perceive and what they want other people to believe about them. Um, and again, and that creates kind of a misconception of what is reality, right? What are actually other people doing? What how are they spending their time? What are they achieving? Um, which we kind of at the back of our minds, we know it's not real, but it impacts us in this unconscious way when we're actually, it leads us to feel like, oh, my life is not good enough because all these other people are going on holiday and getting these great jobs or, right? And these like amazing relationships or where am I? So that's also another kind of, um, aspect where you're getting information, but it's curated information. So it's not a real reflection of reality. Yeah, I tend to think that, you know, as humans, we've been around for, well, we've been evolving for millions of years. Technology is a, well, recent technology, social media we've had for the past, what, 20 or so, less than 20 years. I kind of think that our hardware, our bodies, our brains are outdated for this newer software, though also humans do, we tend to adapt quite quickly, you know, depending on our surroundings. That's just basic survival of the fittest. So I guess my question there is, is the internet and all of this information, some good, some bad, is it something that we can learn to adapt to rather quickly? Because again, anecdotally, it seems quite disastrous um we know that mental health is worse for teenagers with instagram we know that well didn't facebook do something to sway one of the political elections somewhere in the world it might even have been mm -hmm. in england we know yeah. that there are people acting in bad faith but in the influential mind you said that the when you search on google it's taking your browser history and catering articles specifically for you and i thought well, of course, of course it does that. But I didn't I didn't think I didn't make that connection at the time. But of course they do do that. So is it something that we can learn to manage and fairly quickly before damage is done? Or are you optimistic about it, basically? <laughs> yeah, that's one thing that I'm not optimistic about. Um, so the problem here is that social media platforms and also other like just search engines are actually engineered to work with how our brain operates. Uh, in a way that is not beneficial for us, right? So basically we have, a, like, there's needs and biases that we have. We are very um, receptive to what other people are thinking, right? Um, to feedback from other people. Um, we want to know about them. Um, we really like these, like, likes, like little immediate rewards that we will, like, go out of our way and do, like, 100 photos just to get, like, more likes, more shares, which is kind of, you know, I mean, there is some financial, you know, relation to it, but it, in the end, it's a little bit silly. Um, and so social media has basically engineered a platform where it's catering to these things, to our need for, like, immediate rewards all the time and, like, this social environment. 
um, it's a lot of these kind of external rewards, right? And the, the confirmation bias, our tendency to look for information that confirms what we already believe, to be with people, to kind of look out for information from people who are like us. So it's catered in a way that fits exactly to our biases um, and makes them worse. Mm. Um, so for that reason, um, it is a little bit difficult to think like how are we really going to adapt because it 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 kind of fits to how our brain already works but in a way that is like not the good aspects necessarily or in or at least not in these kind of doses mm -hmm. um so that that is a problem and it's unclear to me how we can adapt without any real change to the platforms themselves to the search engines themselves yeah. which the, it's only going to happen if there's actual um, policy change, right? If it comes from from above. So um, unless there's those kind of changes, I'm not really optimistic um, about that. Yeah, I don't see neither. how you could suddenly, I mean, yeah, it's really, really hard. It's kind of like it tricks us in a way that will be really hard for us to overcome, I think. Yeah, and it's difficult because even if you are cognizant of the effects of social media, you know, you have like a Facebook status and you get some likes and it gives you a little bit of dopamine or whatever. I'm very aware of those effects. And yet sometimes I still find that I fall prey to it even whilst being aware. And I'm not sure how, I'm not as bad as many people. I'm not out there doing crazy stunts just to get a million views or a million likes, but I can see the appeal for sure. Um I wonder what it's going to be like for the generation that's younger than me, the the people that are turning into teenagers now that have grown up with this stuff. Because, you know, at least when I was under 10, I didn't have a computer. I didn't, you know, Instagram and YouTube didn't rule my life back then. So I wonder what the effects are going to be on the next generation who have just naturally grown up with this. Yeah, no, it's it's very frightening. And as you say, there's this kind of distinction between what you know is good for you or what's bad for you. And yet what you end up doing, it's so hard um, to kind of really put, you can put a policy in place for yourself, right? And people do that sometimes, you know, they download these apps where it, it's like there's only a certain amount of time that it lets you like go on to Twitter or whatever. So you can use these kind of things. But yeah, the fact that we know that it's bad about it doesn't mean that we stop it. There was just this kind of um, negative news story um, that was interesting to me in the last few days and I couldn't stop like reading about it and it just made me feel bad and I was like stop it but I couldn't like oh what are other people saying like, you know and I know that this is was not helpful and also wasting my time which I really try not to do but you you still have I don't know there's a drive that's really 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 hard to stop um so yeah it has to somehow, I mean, it's a little bit like thing, you know, it's other types of addictions as well, like cigarettes, right? So at the end, you know, cigarettes was like a, a huge problem. It still is, um, and caused a lot of deaths and cancer and so on. But the the kind of uh, policy that has been put in place did reduce that, right? The kind of like you're not no longer allowed to smoke in public places, indoors, in um on planes i still remember the time that you're allowed to smoke on a plane right uh mm -hmm. taxes on them and so on so i think at some point i think it will be a little bit like that like smoking like other things where um there's a realization that the damage is real and it's great and actions are at some point taken and it it takes time right i mean in all of these cases it took time to first of all get the data to convince everyone that it's real and then to put enough social pressure on government to try and make a change. Because a lot of times you can't just leave um, these decisions to the individual. It's too much. Mm. And you mentioned earlier about confirmation bias. Why do we have confirmation bias? Especially, again, like this is quite an emotive argument, but the vaccine to autism topic it, it's hardly a topic because it has been thoroughly debunked um that seems to, that it's very emotive for a lot of people and that seems to come up and people uh, in the face of statistics and science will look to confirm their biases you know a million children could get a vaccine but if five of them have a serious infliction from it or a serious side effect 
the person in question, I guess a parent, might look to the five that have been affected rather than the million. Why do we seek out confirmation bias? Why do mm-hmm. we have it? Well, I mean, in general, it because um, more often than not, it makes sense. So mm-hmm. most of the things that you believe are actually true, um, right? You believe the sun's going to come up in the morning, go up, go down in the evening. You know, lo- most of the, your beliefs are actually correct. Um, and it doesn't make sense for you to change those beliefs every time that someone comes and tells you something that, you know, is doesn't confirm to what you believe, because mostly they will be wrong. Um, And so we take this principle that is true in general, but we apply it very, very widely, right? So it makes sense for our brain to have beliefs. um, And then when evidence doesn't confirm to to those beliefs to downweight it, it does make, you know, sense to kind of form beliefs in that kind of way. But of course, the problem is that when those beliefs happen to be false, then it's very, very hard to correct them. Um, And then on top of them, on top of that, there's another problem, which is we haven't really evolved for very long to make decisions and form beliefs based on numbers and figures and stats, right? I mean, if you think back, the way that we would form our beliefs is just looking around, learning from the people around us, you know, hearing a story about the neighbor and so on. If you think about the cave age people or, you know, um, math and that kind of thing is relatively new in terms of human using it and being aware of it and all of that. So um, we're still like that. It's still the first way by which we learn is still stories, right? We learn about someone who did something, got ill, and we're like, well, we shouldn't do that. Despite, even if in front of us, there's numbers of 1,000 people who did it and they were fine. Um, So that's kind of the evolution reason but also if you think about why do we learn from a story so easily well it's very vivid right it it can stay in your mind I mean numbers is like okay you think about it and then you kind of forget it but like a story that's something that you can imagine with detail and vividness it's easier to remember especially if it elicits emotion it grabs your attention it makes you once it makes you feel it also makes you think um, and so those tend to be very powerful and ha- hard to um, combat with just a graph. I remember being quite young, probably a teenager, and finding out about the autism to vaccine conspiracy theory, because that's what it is. And I read about it, and I was a teenager, I was young, and I thought, wow, that's crazy. If that's true, I can't believe that's happening. And then not too long after, I read... Um, the actual science behind it that you can test a baby for autism whilst they're in utero uh so that disproves that you know vaccines are causing autism so if you can test it whilst the baby uh, is a fetus or like a far along developed i don't know essentially as soon as i read that information i completely debunked the prior belief i i changed my mind kind of like that kind of instantaneously like oh well that makes more sense to me um but as you said, it seems as though it's quite hard for people to change their beliefs when they're presented new information. So when and why do beliefs actually change? Right. So, I mean, if your belief is not very strong, mm-hmm. right, um, then you could easily change and they change all the time, right? The beliefs that are hard to change are ones that like you hold very strongly, um, which are not all our beliefs. That's one thing that's hard to change. And the second thing is a belief that you're very motivated to hold on to. Um, maybe it's like some kind of positive belief about yourself or, you know, you're supporting some kind of political candidate and you think they're really kind of good and they're going to be helpful for the country. Something where you have emotion invested. A lot of beliefs are neutral. Like you believe them, but it doesn't, it doesn't really matter to you one way or the other. So um, those are easier to change if you don't really have a motivated um, reason to believe that. Um, religion, for example, is a difficult one because usually they are relatively strong beliefs and also they're motivated. And the reason for both things is they kind of grow up with it, right? From day one, anything that you've kind of people told you um, and you've seen in front of you from day one, those are going to be more uh, stronger beliefs because you've had them for a very, very long time, right? Like, contrast that with the example that you gave, the autism versus vaccine. Well, okay, you heard about this kind of um link that is not true between autism and vaccine and then you learn some other information that contradicts it that's fine you would change your mind according Mm -hmm. to what makes sense because the first belief is neither very strong neither or very motivated right Um, but i have to say that um the 
if we take the autism vaccine example, the re I think one of the reasons that people um, are have a hard time changing their mind is because of this fear. Um, and it is especially when they have kids, right? They have children and they really fear that they will do something to harm their child, right? Mm. I will make a decision to vaccinate my kid. And, you know, and what if this link is true, right? So that um, is, I think, different. I'm assuming that when you learned about that, it wasn't in the kind of context of should I vaccinate my kid or not, right? No. Um, <laughs> so when those kind of stakes are high in that way, that makes people, you know, it's kind of like, it's just like, again, it's a high stake situation. A lot of emotions are involved. And when emotions are involved, that's really kind of gets things, get it. It's a little bit complicated. Um, right. I mean, and, and emotions can be involved in many, many different domains. So health domain is a domain where there's a lot of emotions. I mean, if you think about like the pandemic and every, all beliefs relate to pandemic, politics is another one, anything to do with relationships and children and, and that kind of thing. But also uh, business, right? If you're an entrepreneur and you are, um, you're working in a startup, you really want it to succeed. You have a lot of, you know, uh, invested in it in a lot. There's like emotions and a motivation. And again, that is another place where people may hold on to false beliefs for a very long time because they're reluctant to give up that hope. Hmm. Yeah, that's true. Humans are very emotionally driven. I always speak as though I'm not a human. Um, we're very emotionally driven, so it's hard to come. It's it's hard to present arguments that are purely logical, factual, when we are more prone to emotion. But you'd think knowing that would help it somehow, and yet it kind of doesn't. Because um, you've used the the you've used the example of smoking before. Warnings on cigarette packets they tend to not really do much positive effect um having smoking kills on a pack of marlboros why is that mm -hmm. um so first of all our emotions are not something that we want to get rid of right mm. they're there for a reason um they do give us good information about the environment when we feel good about something it's usually an indication that that thing is good for us. And when we feel like scared, there's probably a reason, right? So emotion is, is something that is some, it could be a crude signal, but it is a helpful signal. So we don't want to be just, well, I'm not, they're not helpful at all. I should like ignore them completely. That's not the case. Yeah. Um, and so when it comes to the, to the warnings, um, I think what, I mean, what we find is that normally people try to rationalize away those kind of warnings and they say well yes it kills but you know i'm gonna be fine my grandmother smoked until she was 100 so i must have really good genes so we start actually trying to use logic in order to end up with a belief or an action that we really want to do right but we can't we need to kind of like justify it so we do that a lot uh when it comes to like warnings and teenagers tend to do that more as mm -hmm. well so we find that to be true um, and, um, I mean, well, cigarettes is also about addiction and addiction is a whole other problem where it's, it's so subconscious and it's something that is difficult to control. And at the end of the day, what you need to do is just, as I said, take, you know, there's tools out there, um, that you could use to try to change your behavior in that kind of difficult situations, mm. um, smoking, overeating, over drinking, um, or just like, um, and even in, in cases where you're just taking, you know, not putting a helmet on when you bike and so on, you can try to think about policies that you make up for yourself in order to avoid it. So for example, you can say, every time when I bike to work and I'm not, don't put a helmet on, when I get to work, I have to put money in a charity that I don't like. That's kind of your punishment, right? That's a policy that you put in place. So you say, well, every time I do put a helmet on, when I come to work, I get like a chocolate treat so kind of like you reward yourself for, for those good behaviors and punish yourself for those bad behaviors as a matter of just like a rule that you put in place yeah the immediate reward principle which you speak about in the influential mind rewarding yourself immediately for exercise or not smoking because well it's like the marshmallow experiment you know the future is uncertain but here's a marshmallow now what it, whatever um 
when it comes to you know trying to motivate yourself to exercise more or eat healthfully what are examples of an immediate reward you can give yourself because um, unfortunately for me I see sugar and bad food as a little bit of a reward I think it's um I've got ADHD I'm unmedicated I think uh, my slight sugar addiction is maybe a little bit of dopamine seeking how could I reward myself in a beneficial way for sticking to a healthier diet without being like, oh, I ate healthy today. Now I'm going to have a bit of chocolate. What would my immediate reward system look like? Mm -hmm. I'm just asking for, purely for myself. Yeah. So I, I think if there are other things that you really like, right? Um, I don't know, watching like um, a trash reality show that you usually don't allow yourself to, right? Or something like that. Reading like... <laughs> something online that you usually you think is like a waste of time but you really enjoy so what are the other things that you enjoy um that you can reward yourself with um for not you know eating that candy um and then there's also i guess um social feedback and social um support is very helpful mm -hmm. so um if and, and then progress monitoring that it's also like related. Um, so one experiment that was conducted and this was done by um, an insurance company um, and it was a health insurance company. So they really wanted people to act in ways that are good for them physically, which means eating better, going to the gym and so on. Um, so they used a few methods. One thing that they did is they had this online system where you can join together with your friends and family and you get points for good behavior. Right. So every time you go to the store and you buy like vegetables and fruit, you get like extra points, right? Straight away, they know it from your credit card or something. Um, and every time you enter the gym, you get extra points. And then so you can see your points growing over time, which A is in itself very rewarding to just see your progress. Like you can chart your own progress and see it going up. That's rewarding. And two, you could see that relative to friends and family. So it was kind of you know, I'm trying to do that and I can see where other people's are. And it's a little bit of a competition, but, you know, a friendly competition that also drives people uh, to move forward. So, um, yeah, as we said before, humans are very social creatures and that's why social media is such a huge success. Um, but we could use that social desires and instincts in positive ways also to help us um, change our behavior in ways that we want to change them. You said in the influential mind, and this was kind of just a off the cuff sentence, but it stuck out to me that the most influential individuals are often the most open minded. So why is that? Is it because maybe they can, if they're so open minded, they're just open to different ideas. They can mold themselves like a social comedian, uh, chameleon, not comedian. Why is that? I have to say, I don't remember that sentence, but uh, <laughs> I need to kind of figure out why I said something like that. I would, I'd guess that maybe what I meant was that um, in order to influence other people, you need to understand their point of view. Um, but really, you know, really be able to put yourself in the other person's shoes to understand what do they believe? Why do they believe that? What emotions, right? Um, because if you don't, when you try to just, convince someone else just coming from your own mind what you usually do is you use strategies that will be convincing to you from the point of view that you are but not to the other person from the point of view that they are right so for example you might say if, if you talk about again to like this kind of vaccine autism kind of link you'd be like well look here's all the studies and all the graphs and all the figures that show that there's no link and maybe that's what was convincing to you you and we know it was to you because you just told us but for the other person maybe they don't want to vaccinate the kids because if they have children and they have anxiety and fear right so to be able to put yourself in other people's mind and try to understand why are they believing that which often the reason is so different from what you'd expect like let's take an example of flat earthers like people who believe that the earth mm. is flat right i think there's a, an interesting or at least was an interesting documentary about this on Netflix. And what I took from that is one of the big reasons that they believe it is because it gives them um, a social community. There's a whole I community agree. of people, mm. right? And it brings them together. And it's a lot of time as people that haven't really found themselves. Um, and by grabbing onto this kind of peripheral group, which what brings them together is this odd belief 
they are cultivating friendships, romantic relationships. And now this is really important because if I if, if I stop having that belief, that means I have to say goodbye to my friends. And, you know, so there's these reasons that you don't even think about from your point of view, like someone coming from outside um, of why people will will have these odd beliefs. And usually it has nothing to do with accuracy, right? I mean, we, we tend, I think people tend to think that, oh, we are trying to form a belief that's accurate. That's what we're trying to do, have an accurate, but it's not what we're trying to do. Our beliefs are about like, how can I, unconsciously, of course, how can I gain most from my belief, right? Gain in the terms of like, which belief will gain me happiness and relationships that I want and maybe a job and so on. Um, and it's not necessarily about which belief is the more accurate. So we need to kind of understand what is a motivation and find a way to uh, connect people from the point of view that they're coming in. The Flat Earth documentary on Netflix was very interesting to me too, because there were two things that I noticed. And that was number one, the sense of community, because as social creatures, we are so community driven. Maybe it's a throwback from, I don't know, being hunter gatherers in very small tribes, like 200 people, you know, we seem to thrive when there's community. And number two was that these, uh, some of the flat earthers kept conduct conducting scientific experiments that they were funding themselves and they were kind of ignoring that the results they were getting, but they kept trying and trying and trying. And I found that so interesting that, you know, maybe it's maybe it's fair to say that they were outcasts in their own community and they find this fringe community. Um, but if they maybe hadn't been pushed away as outcasts in the first place, some of them are quite clearly scientifically minded and they're doing these experiments. And I thought it was fascinating and a little bit sad. It made me feel a little bit sad because these are people who have been pushed to the side for having strange beliefs. Um but they were really trying to go. So I don't know. It was a very interesting documentary. So I like that we both came to that conclusion of, oh, they're community driven. Um, that's what's linking them. It was very interesting. Yeah, but you're making a good point that a lot of um, people with these kind of beliefs that we think are a bit unusual, um, they often do try to use science to provide evidence for their beliefs, right? Um, so they're using the methods that you would want people to use um, but of course, then they can interpret the data to fit with what they believe. And it's not that scientists don't do that. I mean, it is it is true that you often find that scientists come in with a very strong hypothesis, right? And they're out to like prove their hypothesis. So they do the science, but when they have the data in front of them, they can interpret the data um, in ways that are more likely to confirm their hypothesis, right? And the reason that they would want to confirm the hypothesis is all sorts, like, you know, maybe it's related to the career, right? They wrote papers about this and now they want to find the evidence. So I think this is not just a phenomena, which is, oh, people like flat earthers, but in fact, even scientists in good institutions and universities um, will often do similar things. Yes, I think... I think someone told me that um, I interviewed this TikTok doctor. He's a doctor in real life with the NHS in England, but he's uh, quite well known on TikTok. And he told me that you can massage data to however you want it. So then I guess the question is, is how, if you're a scientist and I assume, you know, you've got your career, you're getting funding and backing, how do you remain objective? Maybe the data has come back and it's not what you expected or wanted. How can you... How can you remain objective in those scenarios? It must be difficult. Yeah, I think what you need to use, funny enough, is your community. So mm -hmm. um, often you're not at it alone. You know, you have, it's a group of people working together. Hopefully some of them have different opinions. There's collaborators, there's students. That's your group. And then on top of that, if you want to publish something, it goes to peer review, right? So there's reviewers, often with the opposite opinion. Um, or people with no stake at the at all. And so that's how, um, at the end of the day, we hope that on average, the science that comes out is more objective. It's not always, of course, mm. but it's by having different people in the process, not all of which have um, a motivation or a strong prior belief. Mm. What is the illusory truth effect and how does it relate to misinformation? 
Um, so the illusory truth effect is, is when we um, repeat something more than once and the more we repeat it, the more we are more likely to believe it. So mm. just by hearing something more than once, you are more familiar with it. And because you're more familiar with it, you then assume that it is probably more likely to be true. Um, and this is a very well-known tactic, whether it's politicians or it's marketing, right? You have a slogan, you just repeat it again and again, and then mm. people just are more likely to believe that to be true. Um, yeah, and when it comes to misinformation, mm. you know, the same thing happens online because um, people just put some misinformation out there and then people retweet and so on. So you see the same th kind of piece of content that could be false from different places again and again as you scroll and the more you see it, you're just more likely to believe that it's true, especially if you don't have any reason to not believe it in the first place. How are you as an individual supposed to safeguard your brain against misinformation? Because sure, there's little fact checkers that now come up on, um, I think on Twitter, they definitely come up on Facebook and on YouTube, uh, I've noticed, but even so, even so, I, you know, unless there is policy, new policy that is introduced, um, we kind of have to fend for ourselves because I am certainly susceptible to a bit of a, uh, misinformation every now and then. I'll admit it. I'm not perfect. How, how, what's the best way to safeguard yourself? Yeah, it's difficult because really, I mean, there are people who believe differently than I do, but I don't think you can actually know for sure what's true mm -hmm. and what's right i mean there, there's these kind of programs where they try to educate people to try to like be uh able to um detect when things are fall i think it's very very difficult and it's growing more and more and more difficult so i mean because a lot of these, these things like why wouldn't you, how would you know i mean there's no i don't think there's a real difference between true and false information except for the fact that it's true with false information mm. i don't think there's something like a character it's true i mean it is still true that a lot of misinformation um people who um curate it they tend to kind of they know what works so they tend to do oh it's they make it more emotional so you know but it doesn't mean that it could be an emotional story that absolutely is is correct so it's very very difficult i i would say the best thing you could do is figure out who are the reliable sources, right? Mm -hmm. um, which which you could do, right? You can know who is relatively reliable based on their background, what institute they're working at, you know, whether it's like a journal or something like that um, and follow those people, right? So mm -hmm. kind of try, it's easier, I, I think, to evaluate a source than to evaluate a single piece of information i suppose also part of the problem is and i'm just thinking kind of stream of consciousness here if you're busy you have a job you're working 40 plus hours a week maybe you have kids or maybe you have other commitments so you're a busy person but every now and then you're just doom scrolling through twitter you might not necessarily have the time to find out who the reliable sources are and if you're sort of taking things at face value but then it feels like especially with the news because i feel like the news is largely negative because that's what gets clicks and um well i guess from my own life doing youtube i can certainly tell you that if you do negative topics that will get more clicks than you know if i if i do a video complaining about this tv show was bad or this book was bad that's going to get a lot more clicks and views than me saying oh this thing was good um are people driven towards negativity what's what's that about i appreciate that's anecdotal but that's certainly what myself and my youtube appears kind of can attest to that that it's the negative stuff that gets clicks why why is that it's interesting because when it comes to ourselves we definitely prefer positive information right about mm -hmm. us about our prospect about like you know what do other people think about it so when it comes to all that we definitely prefer positive um yeah, it's an interesting why people want just in general, why negative information is so consuming. Um, one option is that maybe it's more arousing. Um, so one thing that, I mean, that is important for like, do you pay attention? Do you remember is how arousing things are, regardless of whether they're negative or positive. So something like, you know, is very arousing, but positive 
can also get a lot of attention. I don't know, mm-hmm. you know, like a, um, maybe like a sexual image or like really nice ice cake (laughs) (laughs) but like positive arousing will grab attention as well but it could be that it's easier for negative content to be more arousing right because you think about positive like puppies or whatever it's not very arousing um and it is perhaps the arousal element that is grabbing people's attention and memory and it's not about valence and valence means positive negative that's one option um it could also be, I mean, when it comes to stories about other people, um, there is a tendency for humans, unfortunately, to um, enjoy negative information about others, whether it's about a book or a show, because it still affects other people, right? Mm. I think in some ways, it makes you feel better about yourself in your own life. Um, but also, it could be, depending on what the negative story is, it could be, well, I want to learn this negative information to avoid it. Right. Mm. So again, if it comes like kids, for example, I tend to find myself there's if there's like news stories about like negative things happening to kids, I tend to click on it to be like, oh, how did this happen to make sure to protect my own kids? Right. And Mm. in a way that obviously is not probably not good for your mental health, but I think it's like this kind of instinct of like, oh, I need to know all of these negative things that can happen so that like I can make sure that it doesn't happen. Um, so maybe it's something like that. I mean, it could you could do that for your own self, I guess. But I don't know. There's something about protective when it comes to to children. Do you know, I don't have children. Um, yeah, I don't have children. But do you know, for, uh, like, because I think if I was in that mindset, I would just be worrying all the time. I'd be, I, I would, because I don't really, I, I tend to not like, hmm, difficult. Let me try and reframe my sentences. Because I certainly do look into morbid things, but I also don't like it at the same time because I don't like to think about the many ways that my fragile human shell could (laughs) disintegrate, you know? Like, I don't like to know about all the different types of cancer that I could potentially grow or this bad thing could happen or this autoimmune disease or or whatnot. I I tend to sometimes prefer to live in ignorance rather than in truth so I can't imagine what it'd be like to have children and be worrying for their safety yeah so I think in in general it is true I mean in general people do like to not know and avoid this kind of information but I have felt in my own life and I heard it from other people I don't know about studies but I'm assuming it seems like it's probably true that you have like a, a flick like going from not thinking about like mortality and so on to having children and then thinking about it quite a bit and frequently because now you have to protect them and you have to protect yourself because you need to be there to protect them right so it's a really switch from not thinking about these things not worrying about it so much to really having it kind of relatively constantly in your mind um Maybe it's also something hormonal. And I think, though, I do think from like what I hear, it's females and males as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but it's still, I think it must be a biological change of sorts um, that happens, um, which potentially is, again, at the end of the day, evolutionary adaptive because um, kids are vulnerable, they need protectors. Mm-hmm. Um, and you could imagine this is something that, you know, you go back hundreds of thousands of years and like that would be something that all parents had to kind of focus on more while well before that, not as much. So um, I tend to think it is a switch that happens and it, it's mm. interesting to see when, when it, does it ever like switch back or not, <laughs> um, you know, once they leave the house or something like that. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. You've stated before that emotions are contagious. You know, we directly influence the people around us, even if, I don't know, you're on the bus and if someone looks worried, you then start to feel worried because your mind goes into alert mode or if they look worried about, and I find that I do that quite a bit if I'm on the tube. You know, if I see someone looking a bit shady or suspicious, I immediately go into, right, I'm going to get off at the next station because clearly someone's got a machete. Um, that's just like where my mind actually it happens it happened on the tube last year someone went on with a machete so I try and avoid the tube Um, but we can you know we do this 
with people in our nearest vicinity and we could also do this online online as well positively and negatively influence people so how do we best be responsible regulating our own emotions so we aren't unconsciously inflicting negativity on others and I ask this because I'm kind of like a quintessentially grumpy British person you know and I don't want to affect my grumpiness onto others consciously or unconsciously how can I best regulate myself Mm -hmm. yeah I mean I do think that in this case actually awareness does help um you can kind of try to um if you know you're about to kind of meet someone and you're very stressed but you you know you don't want to stress them out you could take whatever steps you usually take to de-stress yourself whether it is exercise meditation or watching a funny video or whatever um what we have found recently is that interestingly there's a relationship between um how many negative words you consume online and your mood um and so we found two things we found that if you are in a negative mood you are more likely to then go online and consume more negative information right and also if you consume more negative information that makes your mood even worse um so at least when it when it relates to like online we have we are working and actually we this one is almost done but we're working on this tool that when you google something um so you google anything the results come up and it when you have this plugin that we developed it has a little um smiley face or grumpy face next to each website that tells you how negative or positive the information is right so just to give you more knowledge before you go in so if you are actively trying to change your mood, it will, at least you'll be like, wait, do I want to go there now? Is this like the right time for me to like read this web page? Um, so it's a bit, the way that we think about it is a bit like the nutrition labels. You're about, you want to eat something and you're looking at the different options, the different bars, for example. So you flip it and you say, oh, this is like how many calories, sugar, protein, and so on. And then you can make your decision. It could be that you're about to run a marathon. So a lot of sugar is good or you're on a diet, you want less sugar. So the idea is that we can potentially have that labels for people online as well, right? So they can have those labels before they consume, enter, like take information and enter them into their mind based on what fits them that day. Um, so that's something that we're working on. Obviously it's not available now for people, um, but we're hoping that that's the direction that perhaps um, is something that people could use in the future. And that's a plugin that's potentially being developed as of now. Yeah, we're developing it. Um, basically that it's already working. That emotion tells you positive or negative thing. That's already like, absolutely working we're trying to add additional features on it so we won't just tell you about positive negative but it also kind of tells you like how useful it is to um decide on what you're going to do actions and so on um so those are the things that are not yet ready but the um emotional how happy or how sad it's likely to make you feel on average of course like everyone's different um that one is is kind of something that is already pretty much ready to go for people to use I think that's going to be really beneficial to people if that's, you know, in, in the public in the next few years or, or so, mm -hmm. because just, just having the markers there will make people already consciously or, un or unconsciously aware of their mood going in. Like when they put the little, what is it? The little rainbow wheel thing on the foods that say, you know, green, good calories, red for fat, you know, it just being there does make yeah. you more aware yeah. of it. Yeah. It makes you stop for an additional second, right? Yeah. Where you make the choice, yeah. That's good. That's handy. I could have done with that today. I was definitely in one of, the, I was in one of those moods this morning where I was in a negative mood and I was reading and thinking that I was really working myself up and, and there was no catharsis at the end of me working myself up. In the end, my bad mood just had to peter out by itself my boyfriend kind of said who do you want to argue with today because I think you just need to argue with someone and then you can get it out of your system um but I wonder why that is because I know that myself I am more prone to reacting angrily than I think the average person um <laughs> but I'm not sure I'm not sure why that is I'm not sure if it's because impulsivity is linked to well 
uh, irritability is linked with impulsivity and I'm quite impulsive and reactive. I don't like it, even though I'm aware of these behaviors. Um, but being aware doesn't negate the emotion that I feel at the time, you know? Yeah, no, no I, I actually know. Yeah, I, I think the same thing about myself, too. I, I tend mm. to think that, like, I probably like a, a bit more like angry and, you know, um, yeah. And the question of why it is, I think any kind of trait or behavior that we have is always the same. It's a combination of nature and nurture, right? So a lot of it is just the genes that you happen to be born with. Um, and then on top of that, it's how you grew up, what you saw around you, right? What you, the behaviors that you've learned from, from the people that were around you. Hmm. I think it always comes down to those two things. Yeah. I was listening to your TED talk on the optimism bias and I wonder, um, because the optimism bias, it's, how can I explain it? So with smoking, if uh, like someone, actually, can you explain the optimism bias? Because I'm messing it up in my head right now. <laughs> yeah, it's our tendency to overestimate our likelihood of experiencing positive events in our life, like mm -hmm. having a prosperous career or having talented kids and underestimating the likelihood of experiencing negative events in our life, like divorce and accidents, illness, bankruptcy, things like that. Yeah, because I was watching your lecture and I genuinely think that I've got the inverse of that. I have a pessimism bias because every time I get into a car, I do think there's going to be something that goes wrong. There's going to be a car accident. So flying, flying in a plane. I mean, I've been <laughs> researching so heavily how I know how planes work better than the average person, I think now. And still the thought of like going on holiday in August on a plane is, you know, um, I am overly negative about, you know, health anxieties. Oh, well, I, I've got this pain. It's going to develop in some type of cancer. I also get it about my work life. It's not just health and mortality related. It's, oh, will YouTube keep up? Am I going to have to get a regular job in a year's time? I don't understand how I'm so pessimistic when other people see overly, say, seem overly optimistic about their capabilities why are some of us maybe inclined towards pes pessimism over optimism because i would like to become more optimistic it gets in the way of creative endeavors you know i want to write and yet i get in my own way by saying oh it'll be rubbish anyway there's no point trying how can one like is it possible to make the switch from being pessimistic to optimistic why are some of us pessimistic in the first place okay so first of all um what we find using a lot of different measurements is that about 80% of the population has an optimism bias and 20% don't. Mm. Um, and however, we also find that people have a very poor understanding or ability to um, report their own optimism bias, which means we do find that a lot of people do believe they are realist or pessimist, but then when you actually measure it, it turns out that they do have an optimism bias, not necessarily saying that it's you, but it, um, it is relatively common that people think they're the pessimist, but in fact, when you actually ask them to predict a whole bunch of things and then see what transpires, um, it ends up that they still are, are our predictions are better than than mm. the outcome. Again, in your case, it doesn't necessarily sound like that because you haven't been in like car accidents and so on. But um, yeah, but but that that is the case, especially in uh, societies where optimism is not necessarily considered to be an especially good thing. Um, so. I don't know, I guess like some European cultures, it, it changes, um, but um, there are some cultures, I don't know, French or so on, where like pessimism is considered to be the good thing, not not optimism. Well, in the US, for example, optimism is a good thing. So most people will say that they're optimistic. So like from that, just like the points are, we're not very good at assessing their own optimism and B, not everyone is, so it's about 20%. And C, you could still be optimistic in some parts of life and pessimistic in other parts of life. That being said, of course, there's a scale and it goes from like absolutely pessimistic all the way to optimistic. And there's what you're asking is like, well, what determines that and be like, how can I change? Um, in terms of what determines it, again, it goes a bit to what we were talking about before. Um, about 40% of it is probably genetically predetermined. Hmm. 
Um, and the reason that we think that is how optimistic someone is, is very much related to their likelihood for depression and anxiety, which we know is about, you know, 40%. People will put it in a different number, but around that, uh, predetermined, right? That still leaves 60% that is not. And again, that 60% can be very much related to your environment, how you grew up, um, those things will, will impact optimistic levels again as well. Then in terms of changing, um, it is hard. Um, however, there's some studies showing that change is possible. Uh, for example, from Martin Seligman. Um, and what he did, he trained people to adopt an optimistic um, mindset. Basically what optimists tend to do is that when something good happens to them, you got a job that you really wanted. They tend to interpret that as like, I got the job because I'm really good. I'm really talented in like, you know, interacting with people or something like that. And because of that, I'm gonna not only get this job, but be really good at it, get other jobs, right? So they're now taking this positive outcome, inferring from it about something that is trait, that is stable and, and is general to other things and will project into the future. When something negative happens, they tend to do the reverse. It's like, you didn't get the job. They say, well, you didn't get the job. I didn't get the job. Well, someone else happened to be better. It's not like, you know, they don't interpret it as like, it's stable. It's more like it happened to be the case in this instant. It doesn't mean anything about me that's stable, that's trade, that would generalize to other aspects of my life. So Martin Seligman trains pessimists who think in the opposite way um, to start thinking like an optimist meaning to interpret positive things as it's related to me, it tells me something about my life, where it's negative, more like, well, it's something temporary that I could change. So when it comes to, say, you want to start a new project or you, you're getting a new job, new relationship, what's the best way to set yourself up for success um, with being optimistic? You know, take a new project, for example, what are the best ways to make sure that you do do a good good job? Um, not not trick yourself, I guess. I think I heard you say on, I think it was Diary of a CEO that you'll tell your team that they, you know, they're doing a really good job, and you're sort of rewarding them with positive affirmations. How can you apply that to yourself if you're starting a new thing? Um, well, I think it's good to think about um, how can you get to that positive outcome that you want, right? So if it's a project, the success of a project, okay, what can I do to make that successful? And really try to think about it in details. One, if you think about it in details, it becomes more plausible, right? You have like a, a blue project, like this is how I'm gonna get there, which makes you believe that it's more plausible to do. And plus it's good, because now you have like a plan of action. Um, um, and the other thing that is helpful, if it's something where you can track your own progress, that also like helps with motivation um, and just being able to see that project projection. It doesn't mean, you know, sometimes you will have kind of, you know, a bad day or so on. But in general, um, a lot of times we don't really notice that we're actually are progressing. Maybe we didn't get to where we want yet, but there is progress and we're in a much better place today than when we started the project I don't know two months ago a year ago and so on so mm -hmm. that's helpful if there's a way to quantify it and keep track of it do you have any tips for the best well good habits to maintain in a daily life for the best results whether it's exercise diet so you say progress monitoring um mm -hmm. With progress monitoring uh, does it count if it's I don't know say you're using like a, a calorie counting app or mm -hmm. the Fitbit step trackers? Is that a way of progress monitoring? Yeah, I mean, those are basically what these like fitness apps do, right? Mm. Um, exactly. It shows you like how you progress and it gives you like little stars and congratulations, which is good too, right? When you've reached certain levels, it's good to kind of get a, a reward, um, whether it's like a feedback from someone else or, or a reward that you give yourself to acknowledge that. What if, uh, but what if, I guess, you're a fan of, or you tend to have instant gratification, you know, like, sure, I could, I think, again, this is my ADHD comes into play with this mentality, but I could do the dishes and then maybe reward myself afterwards. Or because I'm an adult and no one else can control me, I could just reward myself now and not do the dishes. How do I, how do I swap that around? Because, um, yes, that is an argument that me and my partner often have. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think what you said um, about your partner, that's probably the solution, right? If, if you're really having a hard time um, controlling yourself, maybe having mm -hmm. someone else observe you. <laughs> Yeah, being accountable for someone else is is kind of the answer um yeah i've said to him many times that he should be my manager and just manage me because i i do have that uh object object permanence issue as well where if i don't directly look at the dishes that are in the sink suddenly they stop existing in my brain and i'm trying to tell him this is a real thing it's not an excuse um well <laughs> Okay, well, thank you so much, Tally. That is all we have time for for today. Thank you so much for coming onto the show. Thank you for having me. That has been really fun and interesting conversation. Yes, it's been really interesting to talk to you. And for everyone else, if you enjoyed this, do remember to like, comment, subscribe, follow us on Spotify and iTunes. I put out podcasts every week or so. And I'll see you. Oh, if you want to follow more of Tally's work, where can people find you? Um, yeah, so the website for my lab is called the Effective Brain Lab. That's with an A, affectivebrainlab.com. And there you can find talks and links to all sorts of um, um, essays and the books and so on. Or on Amazon, just Tally Sherratt and you can find the books too. Okay, great. Thank you for coming on and thank you to everyone for watching. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye.